Hello, welcome back. Hi, hi, with our exciting post-lunch energy. Hello, how was lunch? Awesome, good to know. All right, well, welcome back and, and enjoy and be seated comfortably to Seminar Day 2023. Hope you enjoyed your lunch and a chance to explore campus. And for you techers online, I hope you enjoyed a tour of your own home. <laughs> it's your own student house, if you will. Thank you, and, and yeah, thank you to you. Um, I think by now everyone has the hang of Slido, and, and, that, and the questions have been really fantastic. And know that it is Caltech 4 is the name of the session we're in now. And it is uh, the, the session entitled Frontiers in Geochemistry with Dr. John Eiler, Dr. Francois Tisson, and stepping in for Dr. Catherine DeClear, who had an unexpected illness come up, uh, Heather Knutson. And so we'll welcome her in a moment, OK? Um, Quick description, over time, the field of geochemistry at Caltech has evolved from a descriptive science to one increasingly concerned with the mechanisms behind its observations. This will be a multidisciplinary panel that will ex explore the connections between geochemistry, planetary science, geology, and astronomy. So, and, and we have three panelists. Uh, J Dr. John Eiler is the Robert P. Sharp Professor of Geology and Geochemistry. B.S. University of Iowa, 89, M.S. University of Wisconsin-Madison, 1991, Ph.D. research and on at Caltech, uh, where, as I said, he is now the Robert P. Sharp Professor of Geology and Geochemistry. Perhaps as importantly, he has described himself recently upon wearing a Super Mario Kart toad hat to Renaissance Fair as the most popular old person at Ren Fair. I just threw that in there to see if you were listening, because it is the post-lunch thing. So you've got to stay on your toes, OK? Yay, Dave Zobel, OK. All right, next we have Francois Tissot, Assistant Professor of Geochemistry, Investigator, Heritage Medical Research Institute, uh, for undergrad, École Nationale Supérieure de Géologie, listen to my French, such as it is, Lulea University of Technology, PhD, University of Chicago, visiting associate, et cetera, at Caltech since then. Um, I actually wonder if I can break tradition a little bit. And John, first, why don't you come out and sit? Ren Fair. You can imagine him wearing the Super Mario Toad hat. OK, thank you for that. And Francois, why don't you come out? And we have asked Francois, in the spirit of this morning, to actually just cut to the chase and open with a joke. Right. It so can I be on a... any of your fields. It can be a chemistry joke, uh, planetary science, whatever you wish. Yeah, I had a very good uh, noble gas joke, but all the good ones are gone. All gone. <laughs> And the planetary science one, please. The astronomy one, please. <laughs> the, the planetary science one, please. Oh, yes. How do solar systems organize a party? They just plan it. OK. <laughs> Last but not least, thank you. And you have to laugh hard because these are Caltech professors. You can skip me. OK. And finally, we, weather, we welcome to the stage Dr. Heather Knutson, a pinch hitting today. And her bio is, on, of course, another device. Catherine, uh, Heather, would you like to come out? And please applaud for Heather. Okay. <laughs> Heather is a professor of planetary science in geological and planetary sciences at Caltech, BS Physics, Johns Hopkins University, uh, 2004, while still an undergrad, worked at the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, which made her become interested in astronomy, PhD in astronomy from Harvard, 2009. Then two years as a Miller Postdoc Fellow in, at the Department of Astronomy at UC Berkeley. Cal has been at Caltech since 2011. And we welcome all of our panelists to the stage today for the seminar, I'll say it slowly as you get seated, entitled Frontiers, Frontiers in, in Geochemistry. In, in geochemistry. Okay. That's actually not what it's called, but I can't remember. You'll, you'll have a slide, and then I'll know what our title is. Fantastic. Yes, it's yeah. after lunch, so all yeah. is permitted. OK, yeah. Frontiers in Geochemistry. Take it away. All right, thanks so much, Sandra, and thanks, everybody, for being here. I don't know how to get our slide. Oh, there we go. No, our slides right. are active. So um, you know, Frontiers in Geochemistry, honestly, that's a little abstruse. Like, what in the world are they actually trying to talk about? What we really want to do with this 40-minute segment is get you primed for a conversation and then have that conversation about uh, what is really going on in the exploration of space right now. 
And uh, that's a big subject, there's a lot going on. So to focus it, sort of narrow it down, we're gonna look at two very specific things that are happening. One is a number of opportunities that make this coming decade, you know, one of the most momentous and active decades in the history of space exploration. And uh, the second is this focus on chemistry. How do we use chemistry as part of space exploration? What is that all about? So um, what, is, you know, what is creating this opportunity that inspires our discussion? So one of them has to be the discovery of extrasolar planets. I'm old enough to remember very well uh, the conversation when everybody assumed there were planets other places, there must be, and yet how could it possibly be that we would see them, that we would know things about them confidently? Well, here we are. We know about thousands of planets. I said thousands, but I actually don't know that. I'm like, guess it seems like a lot. Okay, let's just say thousands. Uh, so we're there, and it's accelerating rapidly. This is a brand new era. Second thing, uh, we just flew this thing, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, that has radically extended our capabilities for observation. That will have a feedback on the search for extrasolar planets, but it will also impact the study of the solar system. Another emerging theme is we're sort of gearing up for a much more concerted, much more ambitious exploration of the outer solar system, focusing on the moons of the big planets, the Jovian planets, as sort of little worlds, okay? Instead of thinking of them as tiny rocks that aren't that interesting, or they're just little point masses that surround the, the real show of the planet, the moons are actually incredibly exciting themselves. They're geologically active, like Io, or uh, there are these ice balls that seem sort of inert, and yet we have evidence that venting out of them are organic rich soups of water. Uh, so they may be some of the most uh, exciting places to look for life in the solar system. And then finally, uh, the thing that's you know, most important for my own uh, career, I think Francois Tissot will all say the same, is sample return missions. We're doing a, a level of ambition in going out and getting physical objects and bringing them back to the Earth that has never been done before. So getting objects, from, uh, samples from some of the most primitive, oldest, undifferentiated objects in the solar system, so we learn what it was like at the beginning, and then going to Mars and trying to find little bugs or whatever. Okay, so how does this, uh, how does this work? So there, there's a set of motivating questions, and then there's some materials and some methods and things that we use. So let's get some of these ideas on the table. One of the biggest questions that we ask is how planets form. You'd think it would be a, a solved issue. We live on one. We have a bunch we can look at in the solar system. It's very unresolved. We, we really don't understand physically, chemically, how you go from the disks of gas and dust around stars to the planets that we see. Second thing is planetary diversity. Every single planet or small kind of interesting moon that we have ever seen is unique. Every one of them is unique. And so how do we understand that uniqueness? Where does it come from? How do we process it? What do we learn from it that's generalizable? Uh, habitability. So how do we figure out what sets of planets and what kinds of environments are potential uh, homes for life? And this is something you might imagine. Well, you just look for places that are like the Earth. Who's to say, you know, there's limits to where life as we could understand it could exist, but those limits just keep expanding and expanding. And we have to be very open-minded and very observant to figure out what the real places are where we might find life elsewhere. Will we ever find it? Okay, the, I would say the discussion today about life in the universe is where the discussion about planets was when I was young. People have opinions, they feel like it should exist elsewhere, but where is it? How are you gonna find it? Where are you gonna find it? And then there is an existential question about life on the Earth and anywhere else that we might find it. How do you go from a non-living part of the universe to a living part of the universe? It's really an, an incredibly profound question, and it's one that when you try to dig into it, it just slips through your fingers. It's very, very difficult to understand how you're gonna address it. So there's two different sort of modes of study that you're gonna see represented in this discussion. 
One of them looks at materials that are really large in scale, often very far away, uh, like uh, inter the interstellar medium, disks of gas and dust around other stars, atmospheres of planets within the solar system or outside of the solar system. These are some objects of study. And then we have uh, other sort of more intimate, small-scale things that are more tangible, like meteorites, rocks that fall out of the sky and presumably came from space, samples we actually went into space and got, and then laboratory simulations, attempts to reproduce the environments, the processes, the materials of extraterrestrial things. We approach these two sets of, uh, of objects in very different ways. We have remote observation with either earthbound telescopes or orbiting telescopes, and you're gonna see Heather talk about that quite a bit. And then we have geochemistry laboratories on the Earth where we try and ask relatively nuanced questions based upon the atoms and molecules that we have right in front of us in the lab. So to give you a sense of one of the ways that this works, I'd like to tell you a quick just-so story uh, about something that was just done as part of the Hayabusa 2 mission. This is a mission run by the Japanese Space Agency to go to the asteroid Ryugu, uh, which formed initially in the outer solar system, came into the inner solar system, has done a quick journey in near the Earth, and we were able to go out and grab a piece of it. So this is the first truly uncontaminated organic matter from outside the Earth that's ever been studied without exposure to the Earth environment. So one of the things that we're interested in studying this is the fact that the chemistry of the universe is organic. In some sense, when we look around at ourselves, like why are we made of the things that we're made of? Why is life composed of the molecules it's composed of? The universe is mostly composed of these things when you just focus on the big molecules. There's all kinds of stuff out there ethers and, and uh, nitriles and who knows what. Okay, all kinds of crazy organic molecules that we see in the interstellar medium, in disks. Some of the most abundant of these, well, for sure the most abundant of them, are basically compounds that look like soot, okay? They're, it's not very promising. I don't think there's anything alive today that's like made out of soot, but this is the, the bedrock, if, if you will, of the organic chemistry of the universe. You look up in space, this is what you see in every direction is, uh, is these aromatic soot-like molecules that are composed of rings of carbon that join together to make sort of tessellated collections of rings. And most people who study these have a sort of casual guess about how they form. They look like soot. Maybe they form like soot, okay? Maybe they condense around hot stars. Another heretical idea is that they form by very low temperature reactions at like 10 Kelvin in the interstellar medium, maybe excited by light that interacts with the atoms and molecules that are there. So we just did an experiment just a few months ago where we took the Ryugu sample, extracted from it uh, these soot-like molecules, and subjected them to a really new form of mass spectrometry that is, it's called Fourier transform mass spectrometry, where you basically take the molecules you're interested in and you put them into a little cavity and you excite a motion, so they're sort of harmonically oscillating around in this space, and uh, you, you, don't, you never really collect them, you just listen to them. And the frequencies of their motion uh, tell you their mass. And we use this to map out the isotopic structures, the presence of rare heavy atoms within the structure. And what we discovered is that the rare heavy atoms of carbon, carbon-13, instead of being randomly distributed across multiple molecules, like would happen in a high temperature environment with lots of entropy and thermal energy, they're grouped together, clustered together, something that we know thermodynamically is a signature of very low temperature chemistry. The soot that populates the universe, it's made in interstellar space at like 10 Kelvin. And that is the first step on the path uh, through the organic chemistry that sort of lands at us. So let me now turn it over to Francois. Thank you, John. So we're gonna move from these interstellar media uh, particles and ask the question of how do you go from that to a solar system with planets uh, like our own? 
Uh, and in my line of work, we study really our solar system, and then Heather can expand to extrasolar systems. But the, the general idea, if you look at any textbook, you'll see something like this, where a giant parcel of molecular, what we call molecular cloud, which is just cloud, uh, gas and dust, the particles that uh, John were talk was talking about, is going to collapse onto itself under its own gravity, and it's just by the requirement of physics, uh, con conservation of angular momentum, you're going to end up with something that is disc-shaped. And then those particles will accrete into planets, and it's very vague the way I describe it because it's very vague the way we understand this process. But a few years ago, uh, the, these images that were just theoretical were really uh, bolstered and, and strengthened by the observation of the first planetary system in formation. This is an actual image for once, even though it looks exactly like the diagram on the left. This is the t uh, alma image that, is, that was taken a few years ago. You see at the center, in very bright, a protostar, and around it, a disk of gas and dust. And this is a very large uh, feature. AU is astronomical unit. That's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So you can see that this is a very, very large uh, object. And what you can see, even though the image is a little fussy because it's a very difficult image to acquire, is that there are gaps in the disk, the places where there is no light, meaning that there is no more particles uh, in, in that portion of the disk. And uh, in between those gaps, where we think planets are forming, uh, there is very densely uh, populated regions of, of material that can form more planets as the disk evolves. So, this is, uh, this is all very nice, and it shows us how some planetary system very far away from us can form. And the question I'm trying to answer, and we're studying here at Caltech, is, is this how our solar system formed? So to do that, well, we have to turn to our solar system, and we have to look at the objects in our solar system. And we have grown planets that are very difficult to sample. The Mars sample return mission will be very exciting because it will bring back contextualized sample, and we'll discuss that more. Uh, but one thing that is very often left out is that in between Mars and Jupiter, there is the asteroid belt. And the asteroid belt does not look very impressive when you, when you just look at a cross-section, but it's actually populated by an enormous amount of material, a very, very large amount of small fragments that are the remnant of planetary formation and solar system formation. And sometimes we're lucky enough that one of these objects uh, gets disturbed from its orbit and falls onto Earth, and we're lucky enough when it's a small one, uh, otherwise there's no civilizations left, uh, and, and we get things like this. So this is one very famous meteorite. It's called Allende because it fell uh, in Mexico in 1969. You can recognize on top of it there's this fusion crust that is typical of uh, burning through the atmosphere uh, of the Earth upon entry. And what we do in the lab is that we take these objects, we clean up the fusion crust because we don't want any uh, Earth and atmospheric contamination, and we bring them into the lab and we digest them into nasty acids, uh, which is why we need a very clean and uh, acid-resistant lab. And, and we use mass spectrometric techniques that were in great part pioneered here at Caltech to study very minute differences in their composition. Um, and, and we do that because it tells us everything we need to know to reconstruct the chronology and the evolution of the solar system we get ages at very fine resolution. That's how we know by studying these objects, that's how we know that the solar system is 4.567 billion years old, plus or minus 0.1% uh, uncertainty, so very, very fine knowledge here. Uh, and we, we learn other things too. We learn like how closely related are the different objects in the solar system. So you don't have to be a nice cosmochemist to see that if I plot those two parameters, which you can ignore what they are, you get two clusters. This everyone can see. Except here you have Earth, Moon, Mars, so you have a bunch of planets and uh, other meteorites here. And here you have meteorites that have in common, the only thing they have in common is that they're very carbon rich. They're very organic and water rich. And so you have things that are very water rich here, things that are very water poor here. Uh, and they're separated, there's no continuum. And, and the amazing thing is that there is no continuum, because you can imagine as the solar system is forming and the disk is moving, there you should have a lot of mixing and everything should collapse to essentially the same average value. But somehow, 
two different compositions clearly distinct were preserved. The way we interpret this is that at some point, very early in the formation of the solar system, very early in this history, Jupiter formed. So if you think about this image I showed you with the gaps in the disk of gas and dust, this, this would be a Jupiter-like planet forming. And Jupiter is so big that it prevents any exchange between the outer solar system and the inner solar system. So this way, we take objects that are stored, magically stored for four and a half billion years in the asteroid belt, we study them into the lab, and we can say things about the very earliest step of the formation of our solar system. And Ether will take it away from there to look at extrasolar uh, system. All right, so we can learn a lot about planet formation and about the present day properties of, of the solar system by sending rovers to other planets, by looking at meteorites, by doing sample return. Uh, but if we want to know about planets orbiting other stars, we can't do any of those things. So how do we study planets that are so far away that we'll never be able to visit them? Uh, these planets are so far away that often we can't even see them. So they're next to very big, very bright stars, and planets are pretty tiny and kind of faint. So how do we even know that there's a planet around another star? So most of the planets we know of today were discovered using the transit technique. And so what we're doing here is we're relying on an accident of geometry. So we're hoping that the planet's orbit is aligned so that, that it will pass in front of the star as seen from the Earth. And if we're lucky enough, and it does, and we measure the brightness of the star as the planet goes in front, we'll see the planet blocks part of the star's light. And that little dimming in brightness tells us there's a planet there. This video is actually a video of Venus passing in front of the sun. So that gives you a sense for the size of an Earth-like planet going in front of a sun-like star. It's a pretty small dip, but it is actually one that we can measure. And this is how we found most of the many thousands of planets that we now know of orbiting nearby stars. If we want to study, well, if we want to find and study planets like the Earth, though, it actually is still a really difficult thing to see a planet that tiny around a star as big as the sun. And in particular, if we want to know more than just there is a planet there, if we want to characterize the planet in detail, if we want to know what is its atmosphere made of, might it be habitable, those are questions that are very difficult to answer for an Earth orbiting a sun. But uh, luckily, there, uh, astronomers are pretty clever, and we came up with a shortcut or a solution to this problem, which is if we study an Earth-sized planet orbiting a much smaller star than the sun, in this case, an M dwarf, something that's maybe only 10% the size of the sun. It turns out that little dimming in brightness is much bigger. The planet's blocking more of the star's light. And those planets are both easier to find and also easier to study. So for the next foreseeable future, if we want to study Earth-like planets around other stars, we're going to be studying systems like the one on the right, an Earth orbiting a very small, very dim M dwarf. But we don't know if small planets orbiting small stars will look the same as the Earth. So they might be Earth-sized, but it's possible that their properties could be very different than what we think of when we think of Earth or even Venus or Mars. So something that my group has been uh, working on and, and thinking a lot about recently is this question of what are small planets like around small stars? One important difference, small stars are less luminous. That means that the disk of gas around them tends to be colder, and you're going to have more regions of the disk where water condenses and freezes out. Small planets grow by accreting things that are solid in their region of the disk, so small planets around these cool stars might grow by accreting a lot more water ice than the rocky planets in the solar system uh, accreted. So we are trying to figure out if that means that there are what we term water worlds, so things that are maybe like Earth but with a thick mantle of water on top, uh, orbiting these nearby cool stars, and if so, how common they are. All right. Okay, so let's finish up this uh, discussion with uh, a look at two issues that are very forward-leaning things that are going to be happening over the next decade, 15 years, something like that, and that are going to be right at the heart of our study 
of uh, chemistry and evolution and origins and all these things that we're talking about. So uh, arguably the biggest sample return mission that's gonna bring physical objects back to the Earth is Mars sample return. And this is well underway. We're, uh, we've already collected many of these specimens. Uh, here is an image of the Jezero Crater, topographic image of the Jezero Crater where the Mars Perseverance rover has been driving around for close to three years. And uh, one of the things that it did was to drill out cores, sort of the size of a piece of chalk, of rock from a variety of lithologies, and they've been packaged up in hermetically sealed little containers, uh, and they are awaiting some clever plan yet to be established to launch them back into space and get them back to us where we can study them. So all kinds of things are gonna be done with these samples. Scientists like Francois will ask questions uh, to refine our understanding of the accretion of the planet and its differentiation and things like that. The geologists are going to get really excited about sedimentology. How did you create the deposits that look sort of like deltas on the earth or alluvial fans? Uh, but we didn't go there and spend billions of dollars to look at alluvial fans. We went there to hunt for life. So at the center of the work on this will be an effort to find organic molecules and figure out how they were made. And so part of that will be a comparison with the context of all of the other organic chemistry that's happening in the universe without the aid of life. Can we tell them apart? Another part is sort of a detective story. The clues that we get will not be very good. The organic matter uh, that sits for billions of years in rocks gets disturbed, destroyed reacts, it's chemically modified. Can we see through that? Can we understand what it was before it underwent that transformation? Uh, and then finally, can we recognize molecules that are products of life that's somehow different from the life on the Earth? So these are huge challenges. My lab is gonna be involved in using these measurements of isotopic distribution in molecules as signatures of life versus non-life, evolution versus preservation. So, and then a last thing Heather will comment on. All right, so that's already a pretty hard problem, but I have an even harder problem for you, which is how could we tell if an extrasolar planet had life on it? We have much less information. So when we find these planets, the first thing we measure is their size. So I can give you a list of planets that are the same size as the Earth and you might wanna know which of those planets could potentially have life. So astronomers usually refer to this as which are the habitable planets, and so they usually mean planets that could have liquid water on the surface, so kind of temperate planets. But if all you have is size, you might notice Earth and Venus are the same size. They orbit at distances from the sun that aren't too different, but they are very different places, and one of them is significantly less habitable than the other. That is in large part because of the atmospheres that they have. So if I knew not just the sizes of these two planets, but if I knew something about what their atmospheres were made of and how much atmosphere they had, I would know a lot more about whether or not that planet might be a, a place where life could survive. I could even do a little bit better than that. So you might notice that Earth's atmosphere, although it's mostly N2, also has a significant amount of oxygen. So that oxygen is produced by life and it wouldn't be there if there wasn't life on the Earth. So if I looked at a planet like the Earth and I measure a signal like that abundant oxygen, I might be able to infer the presence of life just by measuring the gases that are present in that planet's atmosphere. So that's, that's the game for exoplanets. We'll never be able to go there. We'll never be able to sample things from the surface, but we might be able to measure the gases that are present in the atmosphere. And if we can do that, we might be able to figure out which ones could be habitable and even infer the possible presence of life. We can do that for the transiting planets that I mentioned, so planets that pass in front of their star. When the planet goes in front of the star, part of the starlight passes through the planet's atmosphere and that imprints um, absorption from the planet's atmosphere onto the, that light. So we can actually see absorption from the atmospheres of exoplanets when they pass in front of their host star. And so this is the technique that we're uh, currently using with the James Webb Space Telescope 
to make some of the first ever measurements of the atmospheres of these rocky exoplanets. And we don't know yet what we're going to find. The data have come down, but it's still being reduced right now. Um, and so we don't know what that answer is yet, but we hope we will soon. All right. Okay, and I think that's our presentation. Sandra, take it away. Yes, thank you. All right, and your questions. Again, we are using our Slido Caltech 4. So what's the coolest thing we've learned from the JWST, James Webb says. The coolest thing. The coolest thing we've learned so far. Um, we haven't, it we've works. just. It works, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah right. definitely. Um, it, it's a big complicated telescope. It took six months after it launched before we knew it was going to work and it had finished all of its deployments. So um, now that it's doing science, uh, the first thing it did was look at a big puffy gas giant planet, kind of like Jupiter, but a lot closer in. Um, those are much easier planets to study. You don't want to do the really hard thing first. You want to do an easier thing first to make sure it works. So some of the first measurements we made were of this big, hot, puffy gas giant. And we saw some gases that we didn't expect in the atmosphere of that gas giant. And it turns out those uh, gases were made by photochemistry, so the photons from the star are breaking apart molecules and they're recombining to make new gases that wouldn't normally be there. So that was um, kind of a, a fun surprise from the very first object that we looked at. All right, um, whoops. How important is plate tectonics in the evolution of life? That's a melding of... That's a great question. So uh, I think the, on the Earth, we often connect these two together uh, because plate tectonics permits the recycling of volatile elements that are needed to sustain the ocean and to sustain carbon dioxide and other things in the atmosphere. If you turned off plate tectonics, you might hydrate the crust, lose the water from the surface, the CO2 might get bound in minerals. You, you might really shift yourself into an environment where life as we understand it on the surface uh, can't be sustained or it would have to change. But don't get too uh, hidebound to that because some of the most promising places that we are looking for life uh, outside of the Earth are not only places that don't have plate tectonics, they're radically different environments from any environment that happens on the Earth. Like one of the images that I showed early in our presentation was of sort of plumes of little droplets and crystals being vented out of the icy crust of the small moon Enceladus. Uh, this is just an icy carapace over a 100 kilometer deep or more ocean to an undifferentiated core. It has nothing to do with any terrestrial environment, and yet the Cassini spacecraft flew through it looked at some of these particles and gas being vented and saw they were rich in diverse organic molecules. This actually might be the exact sort of organic rich soup that we are really hoping that we find in other places like in uh, evidence for them in Martian rocks. There it is, active, live, in an environment that has absolutely nothing to do with terrestrial planet environments. It's an icy block way out in the outer solar system. So don't get too committed to a simple idea like that. <laughs> um, Dean Dogger, again, thank you, Dean asks, um, is there a significant difference in the chemical signature of systems with hot Jupiters versus systems with distant gas giants like ours? Yeah, this is a really interesting question, is why do planetary systems turn out the way they do? So why did we end up with the solar system looking the way it does with Jupiter far out and Earth close in, and why does it go differently sometimes around other stars? Uh, we don't have a good answer to that yet, but we think that the chemical makeup of the star might be an important factor. Some stars have more elements like iron and other sort of heavy, uh, heavy elements than others. Those heavy elements are the building blocks of planets, so stars with more iron and other elements will make more and bigger planets earlier. So you might be more likely to have the planets interact with each other, maybe a planet gets tossed out, maybe another one gets sent inward. So we don't have a good answer, but the, the properties of the star are definitely an important part of the story. Um, <clears throat> this is a poignant question. 
Uh, has any of you checked in on how Pluto is doing? <laughs> Poor Pluto. I really should have Mike Brown, the man who killed Pluto, but um, answer that. Uh, should Pluto be reinstated? And we don't mean he, the cartoon He's dog. biased. Don't ask Mike Brown. <laughs> you, you, you don't ask the, the, the murderer about, about whether the victim deserved to live or not. So, he, has, he had good reasons. <laughs> he says he had his reasons. We'll see. Uh, how's Pluto do? Well, let's see. The last thing I saw about Pluto had to do with uh, the, the, uh, the dynamic geology of its nitrogen glaciers, that basically the surface is more active geologically than you might imagine, but it's doing things with like molecular ices of nitrogen and other things I don't know about. So, yeah, so it's there. Doesn't matter what, whether you call it a planet or not, it's not it's going away. <laughs> okay, another one is we are, we are planning sample return missions from Mars and potentially other solar system bodies. What's the risk of returning viable and dangerous organisms? Alien in these samples. It's a very good question. It's part of uh, everything that John capped under things to figure out. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first thing that will happen to the Mars sample return is that they will be kept in a a locality that uh, a, um, a local that will still have to be built. It still has to be built right now, and we don't know yet. We haven't de determined how we're going to keep things um, from spreading if there is anything inside. How likely? Um, anyone's guess is as good as mine. You know, th this is going to be an essential question that dictates how we go about doing our job a decade from now. Will this, the fear of contamination of the Earth by organisms from Mars that we were worried we haven't recognized, we're worried we're not seeing them even when we try to see them, uh, if we're afraid enough of that, we will not release the samples from a contained environment and they won't go into labs that are really capable of answering the most sophisticated questions. If we overcome that fear, we will, uh, We'll just do, treat them normally, like we did the, the lunar samples. Or who knows, maybe we'll find something living in there. And then the, the terms of the debate change. Uh, a technical question. Are we specifically looking for evidence of phosphates on other planets, phosphates being the key to life on Earth? Yeah, absolutely. So, so in fact, one of the most controversial and fun arguments in the, uh, in the search for life literature was the discovery of a phosphine molecule, a phosphorus hydrogen compound in Venus. Maybe Heather could comment on that because it was a space, uh, you know, a telescopic observation. Yeah, I think this is a good illustration of why it's really hard to look for life using just the gases in the planet's atmosphere. So you're looking for gases that don't belong, that shouldn't be present without life constantly making them. And initially, phosphine seemed like that kind of gas. Uh, in that case, there was actually an even more basic debate, which is, is there really phosphine in Venus's atmosphere? And that actually turned out to be hotly debated back and forth for a while. Uh, is there phosphine at all? If so, exactly how much of it there is and exactly what is it due to? Uh, I think that actually argument is still ongoing as we speak. And then phosphate itself, the PO4 group, uh, this is an essential nutrient. You need it for NAD, HP, and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So you need to have it in your central metabolism. And we think everything that has ever lived on Earth that we know of or any of its ancestors that we can easily reconstruct used phosphate as an essential nutrient. Phosphate in the environment in the absence of life is kind of inert. I mean, it'll do things, but it's not vigorously cycled the way life cycles it. And so when you, we find evidence of phosphate being very vigorously geochemically cycled, it's a kind of indirect biosignature. It's not enough to prove the case that there was life in an environment but it says the hunt is on. Maybe somebody was there doing this kind of chemistry. And what do you hope to learn when Vera Rubin goes online, the Chilean observatory, which is being constructed? Thoughts? Uh, that's a good question. Phosphates, no. As a lab scientist, I can say, I hope to learn what it is, because <laughs> I don't know what that observatory is. But, but maybe somebody who does know. <laughs> 
I, I think I've spent so much time being really excited that James Webb is up and running that I haven't thought as much about that one. <laughs> not, a, yeah. not a problem, just a ponder. We yeah. already covered jokes for today, yeah, yeah. so we can skip those. Um, I, I think Dave Zobel, again, my, um, I, I think perhaps ending on this, um, Many folks, it's, many folks continue to believe that they have a snowball's chance to be among the first settlers on Mars, and that it'll be a hoot. Perhaps you could enlighten them. About whether it will be a hoot? A hoot, a <laughs> Ren Faire kind a of thing. A Ren Faire. Yeah. Look, if they throw Ren Faire on Mars, I'm going. <laughs> Look, it's That's just cool. good fun. <laughs> so can life, yes. I, I, I guess the question is, could humans exist there? Uh, for how long? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, for, for 30 you, seconds, you can, absolutely. You can definitely, you can make it there for sure. Yeah. Uh, in what health is a question. I mean, one of the big problems is, of course, the radiation uh, during, the, during travel from Earth to Mars. You, at this point, everyone that does that, um, that journey will arrive there with massive cancer. And so there's no trip back. It's, it's a one-way trip. And maybe you get six months or a year to do something there, but it, it is a very difficult journey at this point. So Yeah, often the discussion is about resource uh, acquisition. Like, can we get, uh, can we generate oxygen? Can, is there water? It, there's plenty of resources. Yeah. If you have modern chemistry and a big enough power supply and water and CO2, you can make pretty much whatever you want if you're really determined about it. But there are these other factors, like you mentioned, radiation exposure, landing an object on Mars that's big enough that it could contain one or more people and having it land safely. Mm -hmm. This is actually an unsolved problem. You would think, oh, well, we did it on the moon. The moon is little, okay? It's easy to land a big thing on the moon. Land the same thing on Mars and you will not control its descent well enough. So that's an unsolved engineering problem. I'm sure that there's clever people with thoughts about it, but there's a big difference. Like this is an engineering problem. You don't just have a clever thought. You actually have to build it. It has to work. You have to test it. Uh, so there's a lot about this that is very speculative right now. Maybe wrapping up with two questions. One is more, slightly more technical, which will be, how important is citizen scientist access to big data from observatories? Has it brought us new knowledge? We hear a lot about that. And ending with a question for each of you, what is your dream space mission that hasn't been planned yet? Yeah, citizen science access to big observatory data. Um, I think science always works better when the data is public, and so there's a number of NASA telescopes that just take all their data and, and dump them out there. A great example, a lot of the transiting planets we found, all that data is public. Any of you guys could download that and, and look for little dips in brightness if you want. Um, actually, it is a citizen science project to do exactly that, that has found some planets orbiting other stars that no one had noticed before. Uh, so I think that the more people look at and, and share the data and the more eyes we have on it, the, the more we discover. Dream space mission. Yeah, yeah, so a dream mission. space mission. I can oh, tell you a dream oh. space mission. Yeah. So the, the specific kind of uh, exotic isotope chemistry that my group studies, that I, talk, I gave you one little vignette about, it returns uh, an unprecedented level of depth of detail of your understanding of how organic molecules got assembled. So if you're searching for life in the solar system, that's a kind of information you really want. And up until relatively recently, the only objects that could make measurements of this sort were the size of like a cement truck. Uh, they were never gonna fly. So we now know, just after the last several years of work, that an object that's electrostatically controlled and the size of your thumb can make these sorts of measurements. That's a thing that can fly. And so I am really optimistic that sometime, you know, maybe not within my career, but within my students' careers, there will be a flight instrument that makes very diagnostic isotopic fingerprints of the organic molecules around Enceladus, on the surface of Mars, in other solar system environments, able to answer questions about the biogenicity of organic molecules in situ elsewhere in the solar system. Any other quick thoughts, your dream space mission? 
uh, the biggest telescope possible in space. <laughs> Whoa. Um, at, at planets around other stars are really tiny. The signals we measure are very difficult, so it's all about collecting as much light from that star as you can. So the more light you have, the more you can measure. The smaller the planets are, the easier it is to look for things like oxygen in the atmosphere of an Earth-like planet. And finally, Francois, you get the last yeah. word. Instead of going out, let's bring it in, and I would like a return mission to Venus, because we know nothing about Venus. We can't study it. it that would be fantastic. Technologically possible, I'm happy to chat about this after. Um, yeah, that would be the dream mission. Fantastic. Le dernier mot. Did I say Le that correctly? Le dernier mot. Le dernier yeah. mot. Okay. Please uh, give a warm hand of thanks to our panel discussion, Fascinating Frontiers in Geochemistry, Dr. Eiler, Dr. Tissot, and Dr. Knudsen. So now we'll take a, almost a 15-minute break, it looks like, and we'll see you back here at the hour at 3 for Space, Time, and Fear, Survival Decisions Along Defensive Circuits. See you then. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>